Okay, so I'm going to give you a very brief overview of uh, research that we and others have done uh, on looking at the teenage brain, uh, actually specifically the adolescent brain, and I'll come to that in my next slide, because adolescence isn't really synonymous with the teenage years. Uh, we now usually define adolescence as the period of life between 10 and 24 years, so really a, a quite a protracted developmental period. Um, adolescence is a unique period of biological, psychological and social development. And when you think of adolescence, if you kind of conjure up stereotypes of adolescence in your mind, you'll probably think of uh, risk taking, impulsive, uh, maybe a bit lazy, a bit selfish, all these really negative stereotypes we often associate with this age group. Um, now, that is nothing new. Um, uh, stereotypes about this age group have prevailed for many centuries and even millennia. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, over 2000 years ago, Socrates wrote a lot about youth and he said things like, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. So he was pretty down on youth as was Aristotle. Aristotle also wrote a lot about um, this age group also calling them youth and uh, said things like they're passionate, irascible, apt to be carried away by their impulses. This is the age when people are most devoted to their friends. And I will come back to that later on in this short talk. Um, so adolescence uh, is the period of life in which our sense of self undergoes really profound development and particularly our sense of social self. That is how other people see us. Um, if you think back about your own teenage years, your own adolescence, this is probably the time when, if you, you remember uh, paying particular attention to things like your fashion taste, your music taste, which peer group you wanted to hang out with, even things like your political beliefs and your moral beliefs. And this is because this is the period of life in which you're constructing your sense of who you are, your social identity. Adolescence is also a period of life in which um, we are particularly vulnerable, for example, to mental health problems. Most mental health problems start in adolescence. It's been estimated that 75% of mental illnesses first appear before the age of 24 years, and you can see that in this graph here, which shows a variety of um, psychiatric and psychological conditions on the y-axis plotted against their average age range um, of onset. And what you can see is that most mental health problems first onset uh, during the period of adolescence. So it's really important to try to understand uh, what's going on in adolescence, both in terms of the brain, but also uh, cognition and the social world and social cognition uh, in order to have a better understanding of why uh, this is a period of vulnerability to mental health problems. Now, when I was an undergraduate 25 years ago, I was taught that the human brain stops developing in childhood. I know I was taught that and um, uh, I remember being taught that and also I kept my undergraduate textbooks and that's exactly what they say. And that's because 25 years ago, we didn't have the ability to look inside the living human brain with MRI scanning to track changes in uh, both the structure of the brain, for example, white matter and gray matter volume, and also to look at how the brain functions at different ages. We now are able to do that for the last two decades. Many groups around the world have, um, have tracked both structural and functional development in the human brain across the lifespan. And I'm going to try to summarize very briefly a couple of the main findings from the uh, developmental structural MRI studies. So I'm going to do this by picking up on a very recent um, series of analyses that were carried out by Kate Mills. Kate uh, did her PhD with me a few years ago at UCL, but she now runs her own group in Oregon in the USA. And this um, series of analyses involved analyzing data from four different cohorts, so four different independent samples of children and adolescents and young adults. So altogether, 391 participants aged between seven and 30 years were scanned, and each participant was scanned in MRI uh, multiple times as they grew up. So this was a longitudinal MRI study. And um, I'm gonna show you results uh, uh, the, the results of this analysis on how grey matter volume changes 
across um, across this age range. So this is cortical gray matter averaged across the entire cortex, which is what you can see on the y axis plotted against age in years from five to 30 years on the x axis. And what you can see first of all, is these different color lines are lines of best fit from the four different cohorts. These four cohorts were from NIMH and Pittsburgh in the USA, Oslo in Norway, Leiden in the Netherlands. Despite being from completely different places in the world and totally independent cohorts, the trajectories of their brain development showed remarkable similarities. So in a way, this is a kind of replication in the same analysis. And what they, what this, what they showed is this a uh, cubic trajectory of um, cortical gray matter volume, which where it's highest, so cortical gray matter increases during childhood, it's highest in late childhood, and then it undergoes this very substantial and protracted decline across the period of adolescence until it stabilizes in the mid 20s. In fact, gray matter volume decreases by about 1.5% each year during the period of adolescence. This is a finding that has been replicated many, many times in uh, dozens of different longitudinal cohort studies across the world, at least in um, high income Western countries. This is, this is now a very robust finding uh, and, uh, and ha has been shown many times that gray matter decreases across adolescence. Um, this is averaged across the whole cortex. If you look at different areas of the cortex, you see very similar patterns of development. I'll just uh, give you a couple of examples. So this is the same data set from the four cohorts um, uh, divided into frontal, parietal, temporal and occipital cortex. Occipital cortex undergoes a much less steep development of cortical thickness, surface area and gray matter volume. Nothing much changes dramatically at least after about age 14 in the occipital cortex, but the other areas of the cortex undergo this very protracted and substantial change, um, mostly driven by cortical thickness, by the way. So the volume changes, the volumetric changes are mostly driven by cortical thickness rather than surface area. Um, now, at the same time that gray matter is decreasing, white matter is increasing. So again, the four cohort studies showed that uh, white matter increases linearly across this period of life um, from actually from birth onwards um, and it continues in fact until later than this age range so at least until the 30s in the human brain white matter increases about one percent each year during adolescence now a very obvious question is what is going on? Why does grey matter decrease and white matter increase during adolescence? MRI scans don't really give us the answer to that, at least not yet, because they don't tell us, they don't give us the resolution to see the brain at the level of the cell or the synapse. We can make educated guesses based on animal research and research using post-mortem human brain tissue. And from, the, from that research, we know that three really important neurodevelopmental processes are happening in the, in the cortex during adolescence. They are myelination and axonal growth. So axonals grow in diameter and become myelinated across, um, across development. And that those two processes are very protracted. And in terms of the MRI scans I just showed you, that would result in an increase in white matter and a, a concomitant decrease in gray matter. Because across this age range from about eight years onwards, whole brain volume doesn't change very much at all. The brain is pretty much adult volume by about age eight or nine. But what does change is the um, constituent parts the tissue becomes more white as axons are myelinated in growing diameter and there's a concomitant decrease in gray matter. In addition, as Vicky Southgate mentioned in her talk, we know that there's a vast amount of um, synaptic pruning that goes on during adolescence and the 20s and 30s in, um, in the human, uh, at least the human prefrontal cortex. That's the area that has been studied most from post-mortem human brain tissue studies. And that will result probably in a, in a very small decrease in gray matter volume. And synapses are tiny. Uh, so this probably doesn't account for a huge amount of the gray matter volume decreases. But these are all really important neurodevelopmental processes that contribute to neuroplasticity. And we know that they're happening during the period of adolescence. I showed you um, uh, average 
developmental trajectories, of course, there are huge individual differences, which is what you can see here. Um, so this is the same developmental cohorts. Uh, I showed you the lines of best fit. What you can see here are the individual differences. And now these days, people are trying to um, investigate the etiology of these individual differences and also what they mean in terms of things like um, uh, resilience or risk to mental health problems. In the last few slides, I'm going to turn to behaviour and I'm going to focus on risk taking in adolescence. And that's because there is a huge amount of research on risk taking in adolescence now. And probably because um, we know that ad uh, um, accidents, no, sorry, risk taking uh, contributes to accidents in adolescence, which can lead to morbidity and mortality. So we know, for example, that the leading cause of mortality in people aged between 10 and 24 years is accidents, and that mostly caused by risk taking. And that's not true at any other uh, age range. So this is something specific to this period of life. Now, most uh, um, if, if adolescents are going to take risks, and again, there are huge individual differences, it's they're much more likely to take risks like smoking and drinking, dangerous driving when they're with their friends, not when they're on their own. So the, the, the context of risk taking is really important. And you can see this here in this graph, which shows the percentage increase in death risk, so fatal accident risk, when young drivers under the age of 21 carry passengers with them versus no passengers. So there's about a 40% increase um, uh, in a fatal accident, in having a fatal accident when, when young drivers carry passengers with one passenger with them compared to zero. And that increase in having a fatal accident increases exponentially with each additional passenger. Um, so we're really interested in why this is, this, this social influence on risk taking. And I'm going to show you one example of a study we uh, carried out to investigate that. So this was a study carried out by my former postdoc, Dr. Lisa Null, in uh, 563 participants, about half of whom were female, aged between 8 and 59. So they were presented with various scenarios, like crossing a street on a red light. These scenarios were designed to carry a small amount of risk, and they were asked to rate how risky they thought each scenario was. And they were told that all the teenagers that had taken part in this experiment, this is how risky they rated the scenario. So participants were told that this was the average risk rating from teenagers, and in a different condition, they were told that it was the average risk rating from adults. In fact, these um, purportedly came from other people when in fact they were uh, generated randomly by the computer. And then the participant had to rate again, the same scenario in terms of its riskiness. And we wanted to know whether people's uh, rating at time two were, was influenced by the provided rating. So in other words, are people socially influenced? And our hypothesis was that uh, people would be more influenced by adults risk ratings than by teenagers. And I'm gonna show you that in the next graph. So um, these are the, on the X axis, these are the five age groups we tested, children, young adolescents, mid adolescents, young adults and adults. If they were more influenced by adults, um, the bar is below the zero line. If they're more influenced by teenagers, the bar would be above the zero line. So for three groups, the children, the young adults and the adults, uh, they were, as we predicted, more influenced by adults' risk ratings than by teenagers. The mid-adolescents were equal, equally influenced by both and the young adolescents showed the reverse effect. They were more influenced by other teenagers than by adults. So in other words, young adolescents aged 12 to 14 risk perception is influenced more by other teenagers, by people their own age, than it is by adults. We replicated this effect in a completely separate independent cohort or sample of people, uh, 590 people a couple of years later. So we think this is a pretty robust effect. And by the way, it is not just um, uh, applicable to risk perception. We've also shown that pro-social influence, so other people influencing pro-social behavior like giving behavior, helping behavior is higher in adolescence than in adulthood. That paper just came out this week in Psych Science. <clears throat> okay, so to finish, um, we have been developing a 
a sort of theoretical model about adolescent behavior over the last few years. And what we're suggesting is that adolescents are highly motivated to avoid social risk. So we often worry about risks that adolescents take. We think of adolescents as very risk taking. That's how I started this talk. Adolescents have been thought of as risk takers for millennia, but actually when it comes to social risk, that is the risk of being socially excluded, many adolescents are highly risk averse. And I think that's where we need to sort of change the way we think about adolescents and consider the fact that avoiding social risk, avoiding the risk of being socially excluded might matter more to adolescents than avoiding other types of risks, which, which would explain why adolescents uh, may, sometimes can make seemingly irrational decisions when they're with their friends, like accepting a cigarette when they know uh, and are very educated about the potential health risks of smoking. Um, saying no to their friends might be more of a risk to them than saying yes to a cigarette. So thank you for listening. And I also wanted to thank my research group and my funding.